Hi, I'm Tammy Peterson. Welcome to our talk on soft versus hard chambers. I am the founder and CEO of Oxford Recovery Center. We have a medical grade hard chamber program at two facilities here in Michigan. We treat between 60 to 80 patients a day in hyperbarics and are in a building project to expand our capacity. We also have about 100 patients affected with autism every day in our ABA program. We love being able to offer our kiddos exceptional care with an incredible team of over 150 employees. We incorporate therapies such as hyperbaric oxygen therapy, neurofeedback, ABA, physical, occupational, and speech therapy, primary care physicians, functional medicine doctors, health and nutrition coaching, and a wellness program. We are passionate at, at Oxford about using hyperbaric medicine with a plethora of conditions, including autism. The questions we're asking today are concerning the soft chambers, also referred to as mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy or flexed wall chambers. The questions we are addressing are the physics behind hyperbaric oxygen therapy, how mild chambers are different from hospital grade, also known as hard chambers, but most importantly, are they safe? I brought with me today Jeff Mosteller, who has been submerged in hyperbaric world for over 38 years. His knowledge about the mechanics and physics of oxygen in the chambers are above and beyond. With Jeff on board, we'll review various safety concerns, including ventilation, air compression, and supplemental oxygen. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us and sharing you. some of your brain power. Thank you for asking me. We will also share with you our latest IRB research study on hyperbaric therapy and autism. I would like to briefly share my story about how I became involved in hyperbaric oxygen therapy before we dive in. My first experience in hyperbarics was in 2006. And unlike many of you, I had never heard of hyperbarics. My journey, well, it began June 17, 2006. Life was good. I was teaching and I had two neurotypical children. My son, Blake, fifth grade, my intellectual one, and my free-spirited nine-year-old daughter, Gianna. Well, she woke up that morning unable to walk. In fact, she was walking like she was drunk. Mm -hmm. I knew she wasn't drunk and we went to feed her and she couldn't get the spoon to her mouth. Well, immediately took her to the hospital where she was diagnosed with a very deadly viral encephalitis. Mm -hmm. Within 48 hours, her heart stopped beating in the rhythm. She would spontaneously stop breathing and then her kidneys began to shut down. I knew it was really serious when the nurse informed me that they were not gonna transfer her to ICU so I could be by her side. I cannot imagine how frightening that must have been. I knew there was no hope. Mm -hmm. Well, she survived the hospital, but they sent her home functioning as an infant. She had seizures, she couldn't hold her head up, she had ataxia, she was cognitively impaired, unable to talk, walk. Uh, she was in bad shape. Yeah. They said she functioned about 14 months, between 11 and 14 months. The doctors told me there was no hope in that she would eventually just succumb to the disease with the virus continuing to cause more damage. Well, this was pre-Facebook days. Do you remember those days, Jeff? <laughs> I, yes, I do. <laughs> I sometimes forget those, but those were <clears throat> Yahoo groups in those days, and mm -hmm. I joined a Yahoo group, and one of the moms sent me a private message telling me about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Well, for me, it was the only time I had hope. I was desperate to get my daughter in, but every doctor told me it wouldn't work. One went as far as to tell me she did not have a chance in hell and I needed to accept it. Well, I didn't. And from what we knew at the time, my daughter ended up being the first child in the country with that severe brain damage to treat in a hospital hyperbarics. And what was interesting, the doctor over the hyperbarics came in her very first day and told me that we were wasting her time and their time, that there was no way this hyperbarics was gonna help her. Well, then the scary part was they actually did not know how to treat somebody that severely brain damaged right. and with the seizures. Their chambers were pre-programmed, so they knew to push the button to a wound care protocol, 2.4 ATA, 90 minutes at bottom, 
and she was unable to take an air break because she was too crippled to hold the mask to her mouth. Mm. Well, that's what she was treated. After her first day, she actually went to therapy the next day and was able to kneel. Not only was she able to kneel, which she in no way could do the day before, she picked up a ball and held it, threw it against a trampoline, caught it, and started singing the chicken dance. It was amazing. By, wow. by her fifth day of treatment, she cognitively was back to a 10-year-old. She was nine when she had the brain injury, 10 when we treated her. She could see again. She could talk. The seizures had stopped. She used to scream for hours every day with sensory overload. All of that was gone. That's amazing. We really didn't think she would ever walk again because they said the infection had caused damage to the spine. However, on day eight of her hyperbaric, she stood weight-bearing for the first time. Two months later, my daughter danced the Nutcracker Ballet. Unheard of for that kind of damage. Well, what was interesting, mm -hmm. the doctor who told us that it was wasting his time and our time has a video that I'd like you to hear what he thinks about what happened to her. Dr. Bob Wilson is chief of the Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy Program and chief of staff at the DMC's Detroit Receiving Hospital. We had a, a young girl who came in with encephalitis and the encephalitis hit her so hard that she could hardly move anything. And within a few treatments of starting this thing, she began to move, she began to walk. And after uh, she finished her treatment, she was able to tap dance, which is almost unheard of in people who have been paralyzed from encephalitis. Incredible. Oh, it is, it's a miracle. It is really a fantastic. Well, as you can see, he definitely changed his mind. People ask me today, What's with Gianna? Well, Gianna is now 25 years old. She does not need more hyperbarics. She is fully functioning, healthy college graduate. She works in a neurofeedback director. She is passionate about helping to heal the brain and loves working with children with autism. But she says she remembers when she couldn't talk and when she had the sensory overload and many symptoms that we see with our children has a compassion for those kids. Um, she also is a culinary art chef, so she makes amazing recipes in our ABA program for our kiddos to learn to eat healthy. And she also is a program manager for them, so quite a busy young lady. Yes, indeed. Well, let's find out more about hyperbaric medicine. Jeff, tell us some stuff. <clears throat> Thanks, Tammy. And um, I do appreciate every time I get to hear Gianna's story, especially is because that's how we managed meeting. <laughs> yes, that is true. So, uh, I, did, I did come on to Detroit Receiving basically on her last day of treatment. And so I missed the dramatic part of it. Uh, but I was there the day that uh, video was filmed. Oh, I was watching. That's amazing. We so, also have Gianna's original hyperbaric tech actually working in our research department right. here today. <clears throat> so they were obviously biggest, bigger plans for all of us Absolutely. that we didn't realize at the time. That's amazing. We only have a little time to cover a complicated topic. So Tammy will share with us just three slides about the history, and then we will discuss the chamber uh, facts. Very interestingly, hundreds of years ago, patients with pneumonia living at high altitudes in cities like Mexico City, where the oxygen pressure is low, were found to have a better chance of recovery if rushed down to the plains where the oxygen pressure was higher. Similarly, patients with cardiovascular disease generally did better at sea level than at high altitudes. 245 years ago, in 1775, Presley wrote a book called Experiments and Observations on Different Kinds of Air and shared with, his, shared with us his own experience about breathing pure oxygen and he stated, in time, this pure air may become fashionable article in luxury. The first person to use pure oxygen therapeutically on a large scale at least was Thomas Bedos. It wasn't until 1922, however, until Haldane, who was an expert in diving medicine and spent the first world war using oxygen to treat injuries caused by chlorine gas. 
he documented some of his success. In 1928, it was Cunningham who documented success with hyperbarics. But I'm going to let Jeff talk to you about this one. Well, Dr. Cunningham was very complicated, to say the least. <laughs> Um, and he did a lot of early experiments where he treated patients with hyperbaric air. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was basing his work on some of those same observations that people at sea level had done better than people in altitude. Mm -hmm. And bringing them down to sea level brought them a lot of, uh, brought them down as well. And he was the first one, I think, to, to believe that diabetes would do better with an increased um, pressure. And I'm not sure how much he knew about the partial pressure of oxygen at the time, but he also successfully treated a wealthy industrialist and then was allowed to build this amazing infrastructure, which you see this 64-room hotel in, in there where they had a library, a, sm a smoking room. If safety directors of hyperbarics will just go <laughs> freaking out about that, um, and the dining room. And... It's really interesting, Tammy, because he was shut down by the AMA because he did not publish a lot of his findings. Um, and I was taught over the last 38 years that he was a charlatan <clears throat> and that he gave hyperbaric medicine a bad reputation for a long period of time. And when I started in 1984, we were always trying to still overcome, supposedly, the Cunningham reputation. Mm. Um, but the more I've assessed him in his work, and I see the chambers he built, and I see what he put into it, I don't believe that you actually can build that kind of infrastructure during the Depression Absolutely. if you are only exploiting patients for money. Yeah, unfortunately, he used compressed air, not oxygen, right. so the total oxygen pressure was no higher than could have been achieved with a mask at a fraction of the cost. That's true too, but also fortunately he was using air since he had a smoking car inside. That is very <laughs> true. <laughs> so as Haldane unpinned modern oxygen therapies, unfortunately, even today, the mainstream medical society do not have a clear appreciation on how beneficial these therapies can be. Despite research like this, a large clinical trial reported in the prestige New England Journal of Medicine in January of 2000 showed that inhalation of 80% oxygen for two hours halved the risk of wound infection after colon rectal surgery compared with the routine practice of 30% oxygen for two hours. There's a tremendous amount of study about the effects of oxygen on wound healing and the effects of oxygen on bacterial clearing. And that has been the basis of hyperbaric medicine and I think it expands to much more broader things than just bacterial clearing and wound healing. Jeff, when I went to treat my daughter in hyperbarics, I was told by all of her doctors that there was no research in treating neurological conditions in hyperbarics. I had some go as far as to say there is no research in hyperbarics. Well, that is not what I found. There are a staggering almost 11,000 papers you can find where hyperbaric oxygen therapy is mentioned. Mm -hmm. There has been more than one published study every single day for the last year. There are also numerous books written and worldwide. We currently have 63 worldwide clinic trials involving hyperbaric oxygen therapy. In 2019, a Nobel Prize in Physiology or medicine was awarded jointly to this team for their discovery on how cells sense and adapt to oxygen availability. In my opinion, there is nothing more exciting in regards mm -hmm. to cutting edge medicine than hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The interest in this field is booming. It is, and, and it's also interesting, again, ever since I've been in hyperbaric since 1984, I've heard other physicians that are not working in it say that, well, there's no, there's no proof, there's no double-blind studies, et cetera, not knowing that there never were double-blind studies on penicillin and whether it killed <laughs> bacteria or not. And that yet, is. what's more common than that? Absolutely. Most hyperbarics are found in hospitals. They are primarily used today for diabetic foot wounds and radiation damage. However, freestanding facilities, such as ours, Oxford Recovery Center, are growing quickly. In the United States, there are over 1,500 hyperbaric facilities in both hospitals and freestanding. 
Well, the air we breathe right now is composed of exactly what? Well, there are about eight or nine different gases that compose our atmosphere, but they're primarily 78 to 79% nitrogen, and the most of the rest of it would be oxygen, so around 20.7%. We'd usually just round it up to 21% oxygen. So that's what we breathe in. Right. But what about, what do we breathe out? Well, we breathe out, um, <clears throat> we breathe in about 21% oxygen, and then in our exhaled gas, uh, it's a much higher percentage of carbon dioxide. Because what is happening is our bodies are using the oxygen and our cells burn oxygen and give up carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And so there's an exchange where we take in the oxygen and then we eliminate the carbon dioxide. So we actually breathe out about 40,000 parts per million of CO2 with ex each exhalation. So that's about over 100 times what we breathe in, we breathe out of the carbon dioxide. That is correct. That's going to be really important for us to talk about in the next few slides. Yes. We're going to clarify our terminology for the two chambers we are comparing. For the hyperbaric therapy chambers that are not hospital grade, they are referred to as flexible wall mild, bags, or soft chambers. For the hospital grade chambers, they are referred to as hard chambers or hospital grade. In order to understand the differences between these two chambers, we are going to learn about some of the basics. Let's go over some essentials. We have tried to make it as easy as possible and visually somewhat appealing, so you can grasp several concepts here. We have to understand the partial pressure of oxygen and barometric pressures. So here we are at sea level. The air we breathe at sea level is about 21% oxygen and constant in all of the atmospheres above you. So there's still 21% oxygen as we go up. The amount of oxygen we get in our blood, however, depends on the pressures we are at. We call it barometric pressure. Mm -hmm. At sea level, it is always referring to just an entire atmosphere of one, one atmosphere, one ATA, we would say. Right. So barometric pressure is simply the entire atmosphere above you resting on your shoulders. This can be measured using mercury, as you can see in the diagram. The pressure expands the mercury in a vacuum glass tube of 700 millimeters. Hence, when we say one atmosphere, exerts a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. Jeff, can you maybe explain this mm -hmm. differently? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a good try. <clears throat> um, probably everyone has taken a glass and turned it upside down into a, into a sitting pool of water in your sink. And if you watch very carefully, you'll notice the water does rise above the level of the water yes. inside the glass. And that is because Again, our gravity pulls our atmosphere down around us. And that gravi that, those molecules of air and nitrogen, and they all have weight. And the total weight, if, in, if you basically, if you take a certain size of rod and stick it in mercury at sea level, then the, the atmospheric pressure will push that, <clears throat> push that mercury up that rod, 760 millimeters of mercury. And that's what that's where that measurement comes from. And so I like to use millimeters of mercury because everybody out there has had their blood pressure taken. Absolutely. And when, and when, you, when, you take, when the nurse takes your blood pressure, she, depending on your health condition, but she's gonna pump that up to about 150 millimeters of mercury. And then your blood pressure for most normal people are around 120 over 80. And that's using the same measurement of pressure. When we, when we sit at sea level, which most places in the United States do sit at sea level or very close, the total pressure is 760. 21% of that is 159. So the partial pressure of oxygen is about the same as what your nurse puts on your blood pressure cuff. And that gives you a good reference for how much pressure we're talking about. Very interestingly, so at sea level, under normal circumstances, the mm -hmm. partial pressure of oxygen in the arteries is high enough to satisfy the oxygen demands for our entire body. That's correct. And as long as nothing goes wrong, that's more than enough. So a, a, a good example, um, if, if you're breathing in 159, 
your lung and heart system is not perfectly efficient. So that's going to drop down to about 100 by the time it starts heading towards your feet. Mm -hmm. But you have to imagine, imagine these red blood cells as buckets of oxygen. And they have about a, 100 millimeters of mercury in their bucket. But their bucket has a hole in it because it's going to drop oxygen off all along the way. So by the time it gets to your feet, it's already going to be down to 50 to 70 millimeters of mercury as long as you don't have any problems and no circulatory problems. So when we move up the mountain where the air is thinner, mm -hmm. we adapt to this environment by producing more red blood cells. That's correct, although that takes time. But yes, <laughs> but as it turns out, it's not just, but you, you hit on something strong up in the mountains. If everybody's been to the mountains, if you've been to Denver after living in San Diego, for example, yeah. you're going to find it hard to breathe the first couple of weeks. And that's because the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be a lot less. It's not going to be 159. It's going to be less because as the pressure gets lower, the partial pressure of each gas will get lower in exact proportion. But our bodies do adapt to that. They will adapt to it. So what would happen if we climbed Mount Everest today? Let's go. All we need to do is bring some oxygen. You see up there at 29,000 um, feet, there is much less atmosphere above you resting on your shoulders. The air is thin, the oxygen not compressed by the weight from above. But what is misunderstood is that the oxygen concentration is still 21% up there. But because the atmospheric pressure has dropped on Mount Everest, in fact, more than three times less pressure than at sea level. That means the pressure of oxygen that dissolves in our body is only 53 millimeters of mercury, which is incompatible with survival. Keep in mind that the partial pressure of oxygen is more important than the percentage of oxygen. Correct. So that is why mild chambers were created. There's not enough oxygen to fulfill what our bodies need. So if I'm climbing Mount Everest, I'm going to need a mild chamber or an oxygen tank with me. Please do take one because <laughs> as, it, as we will learn later on, uh, altitude sickness is the only indication for which mild hyperbaric chambers are approved. Okay, maybe I want to go scuba diving instead. Now we're talking because when you increase the pressure, you're going to increase also the partial pressure of oxygen. And hyper means higher. So because we are um, surrounded by heavier water molecules, the deeper we go, the more pressure is pushing um, against us. At 33 feet of seawater, if we now breathe 100% oxygen, the pressure of oxygen dissolving in our blood is about 14 times higher than breathing at sea level. But why would I need such high pressure of oxygen? Simply stated, you need to get that oxygen from your blood into your tissues. So, let's say the oxygen, whatever pressure it's at, diffuses into the blood. What happens next? The oxygen will circulate and it is going to all the organs. <clears throat> and it follows diffusion laws, meaning it flows from a higher concentration to a lower concentration or a higher pressure to a lower pressure. So more oxygen will go to those organs that A, have a lower oxygen pressure and B, to those organs demanding it. So we will call this the metabolic demand. For example, if you exercise, our muscles have a high metabolic demand for oxygen and it gets there. Our bodies are wonderfully designed to heal themselves, but the fuel for all of these mechanisms is oxygen. As long as everything is functioning properly, the body can repair itself naturally. But if the oxygen level drops off, for whatever reason, this is where the trouble starts. Kind of like when, what my daughter had, or like a stroke, or the neural inflammation we see in autism. So when we breathe air in, the pressure of oxygen is about 160 millimeters of mercury. Let's consider two organs, our skin and our brain. The skin is large, about 16% of our body weight, and it has a partial pressure of oxygen of only 8 to 35 millimeters of mercury. 
The brain, on the other hand, has 40 millimeters of oxygen pressure and is about 2% of the body weight compared to 16% of our skin. One would conclude that the oxygen, hence, must be diffusing into the skin more than the brain because of the larger pressure difference in the much higher weight. Yet it is the brain that consumes 25% of all the oxygen in the body, 12 times more than the skin. This is because of the brain's very high metabolical demand. Metabolic demand of an organ simply means that the organ needs a lot of energy, which is produced in the mitochondrial and requires oxygen. The brain is a very active organ in our body. <clears throat> to exert its effect, oxygen must travel out of the arterial end of the capillary through the interstitial space to the cell. This diffusion radius of oxygen from the arterial end to the capillary into the interstitial space has been calculated to travel a distance of about 64 micrometers on room air, which again is enough to supply all the cells in the body with oxygen uh, and meet the demand in most cases. But what happens when the capillary supplying the cells with oxygen is shut down? In the brain, this can create a stroke, and the cells that normally get supplied by the capillaries are now not supplied with adequate oxygen. In the skin, this usually is not a problem. As we discussed, the metabolical demand is slow, so the cells don't need a lot of energy to operate themselves. This is why when you cut your skin, over time it heals, or we can perform skin grafting with burn victims even if the skin didn't get oxygen for some time. Since the brain, however, has a huge metabolical demand, cells die after several minutes, if not rapidly supplied with oxygen. Oxygen from other capillaries now need to be made available for the least amount of damage. With a soft chamber, you can increase the atmospheric pressure by about 0.3 to 0.127. However, it may only enhance the penetration of the, of the tissue by a mere 18 additional micrometers. With HBO at a level of 2.0 to 2.5, this diffusion radius has been calculated to traverse a distance of 247 micrometers. Wow. So more than four times the normal amount. This is why during the immediate post-injury period of a crush injury, the maintenance of these tissue oxygenation is critical. Well, this is a picture of Jeff sitting at the chamber controls of a multi-place chamber. Jeff joined my company in July of 2019. Of interest, he had had 35 years of hyperbaric experience and had never heard of mild chambers. He was the perfect one to do the research as he had no bias either way. He just wanted to know the safety and physics of the chambers. Jeff did a ton of research, and he is here today to explain what he has found. We're going to talk about first soft or mild hyperbaric chambers. Well, we currently live in the golden age of soft, mild, flexible wall chambers. They come in every shape. They come in every size, variety, and color you can imagine. They even come in some colors you can't imagine. <laughs> I couldn't determine if this was a Pac-Man ghost or a stormtrooper. <laughs> so let's examine um, these chambers from their own paperwork. I managed to get a copy of, of a prominent manufacturer of uh, flexible wall chambers. So let's examine these chambers and their parameters much more closely. This is public information from the owner's operating manual of a leading soft chamber manufacturer. It's typical of the style, and it's neither an endorsement nor a rebuke of this style of chamber, merely a presentation of the design nature and safety parameters of the type. What do they all have in common? One, their working pressure is between 1 and 1.27 ATA. They are mostly compressed with air, and rarely they also have oxygen concentrators as well. So these are some of the basics, and there's a little bit of a review. So they use air pressures between 1 and oh, 1.27. They're generally not approved for compression with 100% oxygen. 
and general in both the United States and in Canada, chambers, atmospheres of not of a monoplace type of chamber that we use, but of this type of chamber is generally not allowed to exceed 23.5% because the chambers aren't grounded. So we're looking at about 23.5% uh, concentration of oxygen. And what they do is they use the mechanical effect of Dalton's law to increase the surface equivalent value of oxygen for enhanced oxygen therapy. And so if you look at the specifications on their chamber, as you can see right here, um, they take three to four minutes uh, to inflate and they uh, go to four pounds per square inch, which would be the measurements used on the, um, on the dial of the chamber itself. Okay, and as you can see here, I've highlighted four PSI is 1.27 ATA. So it's just about a 25% increase okay. in the total pressure that we live at. Now let's consider the equation. So, so I also see that's equivalent to going about nine feet below sea level. That's correct. And, and whereas in our hard shell chambers, we go 33 to 45 feet, feet under sea level. So yes. So now consider the equation for determining the arterial oxygen pressure relative to ambient pressure and the percentage of oxygen in the gas mixture. Remember earlier when we were talking about atmospheric pressure and oxygen being 21% of our atmosphere and that 21% of the total of 760 was 159 millimeters of mercury. And then by the time it goes through your heart and lungs, it would already be down to 100. This is the equation of how that's calculated. Mm. Okay, and so it's just a function of the uh, arterial pressure is basically the pressure in millimeters of mercury minus water vapor. Mm -hmm. And water vapor is typically about 47 millimeters of mercury to subtract out, times the percentage of oxygen that you're breathing, minus Planck's solubility <laughs> constant, which, which is the solubility of oxygen in uh, blood. And so when you, when you calculate that all out, if you're breathing air at sea level, which has 159 millimeters of mercury to begin with, uh, or 21%, basically you end up with 99.73 millimeters of mercury as your arterial blood. Well, I know this is a lot of formulas, and I remember learning this when I received my certification in hyperbaric okay. medicine, but it's going to make sense to our listeners soon why this is important for them to understand. Okay. And we won't go, we won't go through them uh, as in much detail as makes me happy, but we'll... <laughs> Thank we'll, you, we'll, Jeff. <laughs> we'll highlight the, we'll get to the bullet points. Okay. So if you're breathing uh, air in a mild hyperbaric chamber at 1.27 ATA, you can see here that will, you apply that to the formula and you can increase from 99 uh, millimeters of mercury to 142. So that sounds good. Okay, so that's a, it's a little bit of an increase. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's consider the safety of the chambers. That's important to me. Are they safe? <clears throat> well, let's talk about that. Okay. Okay, because here, uh, on page 11 in their manual, they say this, that no specialized training is required to operate the portable mild hyperbaric chamber. However, please follow the initial chamber setup procedure before administering the treatment. And then it goes on in the next paragraph to say there are no known usage hazards associated with portable mild hyperbaric chambers. That's quite a bold statement. That is a bold statement. And however is a fancy form of but. Yeah. And as Ned Stark once said, everything that comes after the butt or before the butt is horse, well, you know. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Okay. All right. So then they also say the Valsalva maneuver is, in other words, closing your mouth, pinching your nose, and blowing will help equalize uh, pressure on the eardrums. And the alternative, yawning and unlocking the lower jaw often stretches um, the muscles around the ears enough to allow the eardrum to equalize. This sounds like a little bit of specialized training to me. It does it to me too. Like a, so pressurizing, even though mild, may cause ear discomfort. 
Well, now we went from no hazard to ear discomfort just in a couple of pages. Often lowering the pressure for about a minute to the point where the person does not feel discomfort um, will enable the patient to equalize their ears. Then it says in the next paragraph that the patient experiences excruciating pain, it may be a sign of other existing medical problems. Here again, excruciating pain goes beyond no hazard. I would say so. And then I realize that it says the patient's physician should be consulted. Right. Um, I hope their patient's physician understands hyperbaric medicine. I hope so too. And as you know, Tammy, you've operated chambers. You know that most of our patients, if they're going to have any difficulties with their ears, will have them in the first four PSI. Absolutely. Okay. Then it goes on to say that all persons treated in the hyperbaric chamber must be informed that in the highly unlikely event of a rapid decompression, they must exhale. Okay. Uh, we know what that means with our hyperbaric training. Right. But I wonder if somebody running a mild chamber is trained on what happens in a rapid decompression and why they would have to inform the patient to exhale. Right, if they don't, if they don't know that from their own experience, they won't learn it in this manual. But basically compress gas. When you compress gas, you put twice as much gas or you put more gas in the same space. And when you reduce the pressure, that gas expands. If the gas expands rapidly enough, it can cause a pulmonary overinflation, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Sounds more than and like no hazards. No hazards. And also, I do know, I, I learned in Atlanta this this past year that um, <clears throat> one of these chambers will we'll see they have quick disconnects for the where the compressor quick connects to the uh, supply to the chamber those can pop off oh and in one case some parents who were treating their child the quick disconnect popped off they didn't stay in the room they were not, they, they again they thought it was mild, no problems. They could just let it run. They left the room to do something else, and the child suffocated um, because all the air came out of the chamber. That's really scary. Yeah, it is. Here again, just on another thing, when they're talking about bringing the chamber back to the surface, it says depressurizing too rapidly, which would be the case if the quick disconnect came off, Oh yeah, can cause ear pain. Here again, ear pain is is not nothing. So we can have lung issues and yeah. ear issues. Right. Sounds serious to me. In, in a very mild exposure that doesn't give the therapeutic dose you might consider. That's true. Okay. So what risk does their manual talk about that are available in there to their chambers? And they do list these risks as the following. And this is what the manufacturer states. You can get otic or otic barotrauma, decompression sickness, pulmonary hyperexpansion, and excessive carbon dioxide exposure. So that's from their manual. This is from their manual, yes. That's, that's an interesting list of four. Let's learn some more. It is. Okay, so the first one is otic barotrauma, and this is increased pressure on the tympanic membrane causing rupture. So Here your again. eardrum can rupture. Can rupture, yes. Even at low pressures. We yes. know in using the medical grade chambers that we would always say, if there's going to be a problem, it's going to happen in the first few feet. That's correct. And, and it's often said that four PSI change is enough to cause a rupture in some cases. Kind of what the Texan will say when they're treating our patients here is, if we can just get them to five PSI G, it's mm -hmm. golden, and they won't have any ear problems. It's always in those first few feet. That is correct. But as you can see, the, the, from their opening statement that there aren't any special, there's no special training needed to run these chambers and that there's no real hazards. risk to the chambers, yeah. they go on to list actually some potentially serious hazards. And this is just a description of the ear canal and, and how that would work. And if you, if you have a cold, if you have some congestion, that can cause swelling, which closes your eustachian tube and takes away your ability to equalize the middle ear. 
Absolutely. And that is We're, where the damage can happen. We spent a lot of training on how to help our patients clear their ears. <clears throat> now this was an odd one. The second one they mentioned was decompression De sickness. I couldn't get understand that one. I, I don't understand that either because as you pointed out in their graphic that they showed of pressure comparisons, you're, um, you're basically diving to an equivalent of nine feet of seawater. Yes. And I can tell you, you have to stay at nine feet of seawater for three or four days, <laughs> and maybe not even then, to, uh, to get decompression sickness. So I'm not exactly sure why they mentioned this, other than to tell you, you're not very likely to get it. But why bring it up? And I, I, I was sure. surprised that it listed as one of the concerns, which basically would say is not a concern. Right. You are not going to get decompression sickness when you're in a mild hyperbaric chamber. Can that, you agree with that? I would agree. You're not going to get it. <laughs> and you're not going to get it in a hard shell hyperbaric chamber because the patient's breathing 100% oxygen. oxygen. Absolutely. So both environments, both the medical grade, right. um, monoplace heart chambers, and the multi-place that they're breathing 100% oxygen and a mild, we don't have to worry about decompression sickness. That is correct. Now for scuba diving, we're gonna worry about it. That's another case, but that's okay. another lecture for another day. Sounds good, <laughs> let's go on. Okay, <clears throat> now this is, a, this is a real concern, pulmonary over, over expansion. And this is an un, uncontrolled expansion of a volume of air in the lungs that is caused by a rapid pressure drop. Here and again, in some of those chambers, those quick disconnects have been known to pop off. What about and that would cause a rapid decompression. Something we train a lot in hyperbaric medicine in our certification is that if somebody's having a seizure and mm -hmm. they stop breathing, you don't want to bring them up. That Can is you... correct. And I'm not sure why they would be treating people. The odds of an oxygen toxicity seizure would be low in the mild chamber, but patients do have seizure disorders. And if they were having one, and you were to panic and bring them out during that seizure, you could cause this Lung. pulmonary yeah. overspace. Because here again, the decompressing gases are expanding. And if the lungs aren't exhaling all of that gas, then, then you can get it's like a, a blue pneumothorax or a gas embolism. Absolutely. And this is something that could easily be part of training if they wanted to train to use a chamber to know how to safely bring somebody out of a mild chamber so they don't have to worry about this. That is correct. And then here's just a, um, a slide I made mm -hmm. to give you some perspective on the pressure change, why we're talking about why it's so much harder from zero to four PSI than say four to eight or 15 mm -hmm. PSI. Usually, like I said, if we can get them past the first four, we're good to go. And as you can see, when you plot the pressure change over the, over the pressure increase or the percentage of change much earlier in the dives, by the time you get to four PSI, you have already done most of your major change and it graduates from there. And we do have a, we do have a little film to show here that will uh, show um, what happens when you reduce pressure on a balloon in this case, but imagine your lungs as two balloons. What's interesting is the manufacturers themselves say that anyone can safely run a chamber. I would say a little training might be very beneficial to keep their child safe. I, I would say that as well. And, and I, again, the things are rare, but it's the rare things where, that happen when you really need to know what you're doing. Absolutely.
So according to Boyle's law, when you increase pressure, gas is compressed, and when you decrease it, the pressure gas expands. Each person inside any hyperbaric chamber is the most vulnerable during the pre uh, pressure reduction in the pressure range between 4 and 1 PSI, which is the very end of the treatment. This is the single most dangerous period of the treatment. Yeah, I really wish they would have some training in their manual of what to happen when you're bringing your patient up at the very end. Right. So then the, the last risk that they um, um, mentioned, and this is important too, is that there's a possibility <clears throat> of an increased risk of carbon dioxide uh, poisoning. In fact, that is probably what they suspected of the child when the quick, mm. quick release disconnected and the chamber collapsed down on him. Um, he probably died of um, asphyxiation from carbon dioxide poisoning. Oh, how horrible. In their manual it says, as, as long as the chamber uh, compressor is on and running, fresh air will be introduced into the chamber and the equilibrium value for carbon uh, dioxide concentration will remain at less than 1%. You only need a 3% um, um, percentage of carbon dioxide to become toxic for a human. Wow. Just after they talk about the carbon dioxide, which they say, as long as the compressor is running, is not going to happen. They have this, they have this warning here. It says sometimes patients will experience a temperature increase, and it says to alleviate excessive warm air that may build up inside the chamber, slightly open the air pressurization depressurization valve to release the pressure, um, and and warm air since reducing the pressure reduces air temperature and then resumably pressurization by closing the valve. So basically they're saying use the gas laws to lower the pressure real quick to make it feel cooler and then gradually pressurize it back up. And then it says it is possible that, uh, that under pressure an individual may perspire profusely and the chamber view may fog. Why would it fog, Jeff? Well, that's what's interesting because it says to me that diaphoresis and fogging of the chamber are both signs of a carbon dioxide buildup. That makes me now question whether or not the, 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 uh, the compressor is actually providing the proper ventilation. Mm -hmm. When they Let's put this warning on yeah. So that, that, was, that one stuck out to me as well. Well, especially since carbon dioxide poisoning toxicity has a lot of symptoms that are similar to what people are treating. Right. And they may easily be missing and continue treatment, continuing to expose them to toxicity, not even realizing that's what's happening to the patient inside the chamber. So what is the risk of a carbon dioxide buildup? Let's talk about that. Let's drill down on it a little bit. And let's consider a popular 21-inch chamber. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show an equation, but not go through it. <laughs> Thank but, you. But basically, this is the equation for the, um, for the volume of a sphere. And we can see that the volume of a 20-inch chamber is 18 cubic feet. Okay. All right? And if you pressurize that to 1.27, you're going to have more than 18 cubic feet. That's the beauty of gas. And that's the beauty of what we're doing with the hyperbarics is we can <laughs> yes. compress these gases and get more in the same space. So you can use this equation, and those of you who want to... Uh, <laughs> Help you can, yourself. You can, you can stay after class and we'll get up on the chalkboard <laughs> and, <clears throat> and do these out. But using the following equation, you can then figure out that in a 18-foot um, cubic foot chamber, at 1.27, you'll actually have 23 cubic feet of chamber, okay. almost 24 cubic feet. For the, for the volume, right. okay? So then we talked about the CO2 level only needs to be 3% to of be that toxic. to become toxic. So 3% of, um, of, of CO2 will be built up in about 42 minutes as the body produces one cubic foot of CO2 per hour. Okay. So in an inadequate amount of ventilation, you can you can make that chamber toxic in a very short period of time. 42 minutes is less than most treatments. Yes. Yes. So in review, looking at the risk, um, there is a real but rare risk of otic barotrauma, 
and particularly if the patient has a cold, and if the chamber operator isn't trained on how to gradually increase the pressure, you can have uh, ear pain. Uh, you cannot get decompression sickness. We don't have to worry about that at all. Don't have to worry about that. But you can get a pulmonary hyperexpansion, and you can get carbon dioxide in these chambers if things are not going uh, and operated properly. And again, the thing that worries me the most is they say no training is revol involved, but you have to have some training to know that these things could possibly happen. And what they are. I'm right. not sure all parents would understand what these are or even the symptoms of something as simple as carbon dioxide poisoning. Right. So now, does, do these chambers sufficiently ventilate to prevent a CO2 buildup? What is, the, uh, what is the proper ventilation rate? Inquiring minds want to know. I really want to know. Okay. There's, a, there's an organization called the NFPA, and they provide a document which gives a lot of the standards that you should adhere to in order to do safe chamber operations. And they divide chambers into Class A and Class B and Class C. A Class A is a multi-place chamber that's compressed with air. Like our picture here. Where the patients are breathing oxygen through a hood or a mask. Yes. And for a Class A chamber, the NFPA says that the ventilation rate should be three cubic feet per minute per person that's not on a device. Okay. So in this case, our tech in the back who's looking after the patients is one person exhaling a CO2 into the chamber. And for him, we need three cubic feet per minute inside the chamber. Now that adjusts at different pressure. So the chamber operator has to know at what pressure, what the ventilation rate ought to be. Now I know when my daughter treated at the multi-place chamber that you ended up working at, mm -hmm. that if the, um, if the oxygen level was not at a certain ventilation rate, they would actually get an alarm and they had mm -hmm. to check on things. Right. If there was too much oxygen in the right. chamber, they were, it was actually able to calculate how much oxygen was in the chamber. Right. A multi-place chamber, a class A, is required to have a O2 percentage meter. If the oxygen, the 100% oxygen inside the hood escapes from inside the hood into the chamber environment, it'll elevate the oxygen percentage. And as the, in the multi-place chamber, they're not grounded as they are in a monoplace chamber, which is designed to be filled with 100% oxygen. Yes. This one is not. This one is designed to be 23.5% or less percentage of oxygen. And that's why that would, that would go on. I know this because when my daughter was diving, um, there was a slight leak in the way the tubing was connected mm -hmm. and, onto the BIP, and the alarms were going off, and her tech was looking for where that leak was. And it was a very slight gas leak, but boy, those alarms are very sensitive when it goes up just a little bit. Yes, they are. And here and again, the mild hyperbaric chambers are not grounded and not designed to have a higher percentage of oxygen, nor, which we'll get more into later. Nor do they have any way to monitor no. what the gases are inside the chamber. That is correct. So now, a monoplace chamber, such as the ones we have, and they can see behind us, Yes. these are designed to be filled with 100% oxygen. They're, uh, they're an acrylic tube and the uh, pressure goes in. And for the monoplace chambers, the class B, they require one cubic foot per minute mm -hmm. of oxygen. Here again, I started out in the multi-place world and the first NFPA manual didn't even have a requirement for the class B chambers wow. of ventilation. And Be because it's 100% right. oxygen. In, in my opinion, they're actually smaller chambers and their, their cubic feet is less, I would think they would need the same or more ventilation than the multi-place since it's a much larger chamber, but they do not. And there's good reasons for it. It turns out here again, we only produce about one cubic foot of CO2 per hour. And if you are giving one cubic foot per minute of ventilation, you will definitely eliminate all the CO2. Okay, as it turns out, the NFPA does not recognize soft chambers, and it doesn't classify them at all. Okay, so okay. how did we figure this out? We know NFPA, not, 
1999 <laughs> very well. Yes, we That do. is, in our hyperbaric world, a document we're very familiar with. We can't operate without it. Absolutely be, be. not. According to our local um, fire marshals and everybody else right. who does our investigations. <laughs> right. But currently, uh, soft, wall, soft wall chambers are not classified by any of the code standard agencies. But they are, in my opinion, they're more akin to a class B. They're more like a mon they're more like a monoplace, monoplace than a multiplace. I'll agree with that. Yet they're being compressed with air, so they're kind of straddling both uh, both fences. But in the NFPA, if a if a chamber operator decided to compress their monoplace with air and give oxygen via mask to save oxygen Which cost. some places do. Yep. There's a few centers that actually do that. that. But then they have to start meeting the requirements of a class A, a with the ventilation rates and they have to be monitored and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so it, to keep the safety going in different conditions takes some knowledge. Again, they say no standardized knowledge, no specialized training, but that there really is some specialized training in putting people under pressure regardless of the conditions. Absolutely. So let, so anyway, for purposes of argument, let's treat it like a class B chamber. In this case, the ventilation requirement then, if you've got one person inside, is one actual cubic feet per minute. Okay, this means you must compensate for the pressure inside the chamber uh, to know what rate the chamber occupant is actually giving. Okay. All right. So... Here and again, the requirements, uh, when just to use a few terms of art, ACFM means actual cubic feet per minute as opposed to standard cubic feet per minute. And the difference is when gas comes out of a chamber and goes through a gauge, it has expanded back to its, the normal pressure. And so that's not going to be a reflection of what's happening inside, inside the chamber. So you have to multiply what you're reading off your gauge by the pressure that you're at in order to get what the patient is getting, the actual cubic feet. It's going to be a little different. This sounds a lot more complicated than needs no training. It, it is. I appreciate this, Jeff. Let's keep going. <laughs> so you can, you can use the Boyle's Law uh, equation here. Again, we won't go down into it, but we'll just show... In the next slide, for example, in the mild chamber, if you're going to give the patient 1.1 um, 1 cubic foot per minute of uh, ventilation, you actually have to give them 1.27 in the compressed state. Okay. So you got to give them more actual ventilation than it shows on your gauge. Now, I haven't seen that they provide uh, flow, gate, flow meters on these chambers so that you don't even know oh. what the flow rate is in these chambers. But they do have a compressor, and the compressor does have specifications on it, not in their manual. You have to go look up the compressor separately. Okay. So luckily you gave me the time to work on this, and <laughs> I was able to find it. <clears throat> but at, six, at, at, their, at their lowest setting, of, they can operate this at 60 and 80 hertz. And at 60 hertz, it provides 3.2 cubic feet per minute, okay? But here again, that's the cubic feet outside of the chamber. You have to divide it by 1.27 to figure, out what's, to figure out what's going on with the patient. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, that will be 2.51 cubic feet per minute. Okay. So with one patient, that will be fine. So okay? they meet the requirements. They meet the requirement. And at their 80 hertz, they, they meet it even more. But here again, there's no training in their manual that you would know this. Yes. Okay, so you don't know this if you don't know it. <laughs> right? I mean, nobody knows anything until they're taught. Absolutely. But then I saw this picture. Yes. Advertising one of their chambers, and they show mom in with her child, and they look happy and comfortable. But then if we do that, then it requires... You've got to go to two actual cubic feet per minute, which is 2.54, mm -hmm. which is less than 2.51. So this ventilation rate is going to be inadequate for Let two me, people inside the chamber. Does a child produce less carbon dioxide than an adult? Basically, they produce the same. So we basically have two people 
producing the amount of carbon dioxide that really we found was only safe for one. That's correct. Let's keep going. So, looking back at the specifications of, of the compressor, okay, you need 2.54 cubic feet per minute of ventilation, and this compressor will not meet it on the, the lower range uh, aspect of the compressor. So, and I don't think an untrained person would know to turn it up at all. So if um, two people, maybe a mom and her child, are in the chamber, a good sign that they're getting carbon dioxide possible toxicity or carbon dioxide buildup, we know, is that if there's moisture inside. Or, That's correct. Or the windows kind of fog up. That's correct. In, they could be getting toxicity that could be some of the symptoms they already have and not even know anything. Correct. Did you find anywhere in the manual that it said only to have one person in there and to watch for these symptoms of carbon toxicity? They didn't really say. They didn't really say. <clears throat> Let's contrast this to our, our chambers that we have. This is a picture of the panel of our chamber. And typically, um, we ventilate at 275 standard cubic feet or standard liters per minute. It's pretty much a minimum. Some people I know if they're um, a little bigger will go up to 350 or higher. Right, that, that is correct. Some of, the, some of the larger folks can demand more. Um, <clears throat> but if we were given that kind of ventilation in the, in the mild chamber, we'd be given 7.6 cubic feet of ventilation as opposed to 2.54. So basically at our minimum, we're right. way over standard. Yes, correct. Now, many of these soft hyperbaric chambers also tout and promote the use of oxygen concentrators to more closely attain the PO2 of that of a medical grade chamber inside. If you see this woman, you can see in the background her oxygen concentrator and there's an oxygen penetrator through there and she's got a mask that she's going to hold up to her face. There's something else I notice about that picture that as my safety director here, what would make you a little nervous? Well, she's in street clothes. She's in street clothes, and what is the chamber on? Oh, yeah, it's on the carpet. Yeah. We wouldn't allow any of that. No. So let's, let's use if, and this is a big if, but if the patient could receive 100% oxygen via the mask, um, then using our formula that we've now seen and gotten a little used to, we could bring up the, the partial pressure of oxygen in their blood to 868 millimeters of mercury. Sounds good. That, that's, that's better, but it's, um, but what about ventilation for the oxygen buildup? Okay. So like in our chambers, I always say as fast as we're putting the oxygen in, mm -hmm. the oxygen is going out. Right, but our chambers have another advantage. Our chambers are grounded to Absolutely. eliminate static electricity sparks. And on the proper flowing. Right. Right, and they're on the yes, right. They're on the proper flooring, and the oxygen is being dumped outside of the building. Absolutely, where it's safe. This oxygen is dumping right through a valve into the room where you're at. This chamber. So is it is it going into the chamber or out in the room? Well, it will be going into the chamber, but you're constantly circulating. So and the exhaust is just dumping right into the room you're in. So the actual, if they're pressurizing it with ambient air and they have a mass that's dumping into the chamber, their oxygen level is actually going up in the chamber, that creating some more hazards. That is correct. That's, that's the point. Now, they don't provide a, an oxygen percentage meter for the chamber. So the chamber operator, if he even knew, and, and they're selling these to people in their home, so if the chamber operator even knew to look out for that, would have no way to monitor it. Mm. Now, the Navy dive manual says if you don't know what, you know, if you don't have a monitor, then you can ventilate at 12 and a half cubic feet per minute okay. per person to keep the oxygen percentage down to 23 and a half percent. Okay? Um, so you, so you can do that. Can we do that here? Okay. If you, if you uh, convert that to... Uh, If you take 12 and a half cubic feet and take it down to 1.27, that means you need 15.88 cubic feet of ventilation in order to keep the oxygen percentage 
to an air normal and the fire safety as normal as room air. Okay. But what happens if they have too much oxygen? I've seen parents actually let kids go in there with electronic devices. I tell you, we both are safety directors. Mm, yes. Does that not make your heart stop and skip it, a beat? It does indeed because, um, well, cell phone and device batteries have overheated on airplanes where the, where the oxygen is normal mm -hmm. and caught fire. What, if, what are the odds of that increasing when the oxygen percentage is higher? They're very high. <clears throat> Let's keep going on. Okay. Now remember though, okay, so we need 15, almost 16 actual cubic feet of, um, of ventilation and our compressor can only provide 2.51. Wow. Okay. Now let's, let's look at a couple of videos of what happens when the oxygen percentage is normal versus when the oxygen percentage is too high. Okay. Okay. Now, remember in that second video, the oxygen percentage was only 30%. Wow. Okay. That was pretty scary to see how quickly that fire would start spreading. Correct. But notice how easy it was to manage at air normal. Absolutely. Okay. So, here are some points to consider when you look at, at the chambers. This, was, this is that... Um, exhaust I was telling you about. It doesn't, it's not connected to a pipe and exhausted outside of the room. It's dumping right into the room that you're in. So what safety concerns does this involve? What is the oxygen percentage in the room? It's going up. We don't, we don't know what these things are when we're doing this. We're just dumping oxygen. And here again, the manual says there's no specialized training involved. So the, most likely the operators don't even know what, how they're supposed to handle these conditions. So the compressor as designed doesn't meet the volume required for a non-grounded chamber with an oxygen mass not connected to an overboard dump system. So in other words, the oxygen they're breathing is just dumping into the chamber. It's not being taken out. In the multi-place chamber we saw earlier, that oxygen comes into the hood or mask and then goes outside of the building. It's not dumped inside the chamber, at least intentionally. Yes. We do know it gets it there accidentally sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat>
And then I, I, I took a close look at the, the typical uh, oxygen concentrator, and they can provide a flow rate of 1 to 10 liters per minute. And again, you have to compensate for the pressure changes. Um, but at their best, they don't really only deliver 90% oxygen anyway. Wow. So remember the fire on the previous slide and the concept of partial pressure of oxygen. The fire uh, videos were at 1.5 bar, which is two and a half atmospheres absolute and 30% oxygen. This makes the partial pressure of oxygen 570 millimeters of mercury. Okay, remember that the total volume of gas in our, our sample soft-sided chamber is 23 cubic feet uh, or 804 liters. So 30% of 840 liters is 241 liters. We saw the oxygen concentrator produces 10 liters per minute and if the compressor didn't keep up you could reach the fire concentrations of the second video in as little as 24 minutes. That's scary. That is scary especially when you tell me that they're taking uh, devices inside with them. Absolutely. So conclusions on meeting the uh, this known safety standards. If you operate these things just on air, exactly the way they're designed. With one person. With one person. They're probably not too dangerous. Maybe it's a possibility of an ear squeeze at the worst. But I would be extraordinarily extraordinarily skeptical of the general public's ability to successfully manage all the risk involved in putting 100% oxygen into a soft chamber. Absolutely. For one, not to be insulting to people, but you don't know what you don't know. And most people won't know to check for these things. Well, I know to operate a medical grade chamber, it's standard that they have medical training on top of the hyperbaric training. And our Correct. hyperbaric training is pretty specific. Yes. So what are the risks of putting 100% oxygen in a mild chamber? There's no patient grounding system. There's no oxygen percentage meter. You're not dumping the contents of the mask overboard. They're just dumping inside the chamber. The ventilation is insufficient. The, there's a lack of an operator practitioner's knowledge of ventilation rate. It would be impossible to prevent the percentage from exceeding 23.5%. Gas inside the chamber is also dumped into the room. And then there's also no ability to control it in the event of a power outage. Or, as we heard about the story where the air supply becomes disconnected, okay. it has happened itself. Very scary. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I, what I really like, Jeff, is that you came when I asked you to do the research. You had mm -hmm. absolutely no bias. You had never right. heard of the mild chambers. You, there was no reason to say they were the best or the worst. You right. just happened to show me the facts. And I really appreciated your non-biased presentation. Thank you. But um, I think we'll all agree there's some risk. But I would like to know, are they effective? That's a very good question. But Jeff, I will say there are some risks with medical grade chambers. Oh, absolutely. The thing that I feel more comfortable is that the staff are all medically trained and trained in hyperbaric medicine. There's very strict procedures. They should have a doctor do an evaluation. They come in with a prescription for the therapy. Correct. And we're also trained what to happen in an event of decompression too fast or any kind of trauma within the chamber. Well, as you know, we have a 20-item emergency procedures list. Absolutely, <laughs> and they know it well. Yes. Well, my question is, we can all agree there is some risk, but are mild hyperbaric chambers effective? It is reported that about 75% of children affected with autism have gastrointestinal problems, like leaky gut or dysbiosis. I know there are bacteria that grow with oxygen called aerobic bacteria, and some that die when exposed to oxygen called anaerobic bacteria. Wouldn't oxygen be making some of this bacteria grow? Yes, this is a very interesting phenomenon, Tammy. In fact, at pressures of 0.6 to 1.3 ATA, the growth of these oxygen-loving bacteria is enhanced, potentially worsening the gut symptoms. Obviously, this does not only apply to autism, but every organism. Very interestingly, above 1.3, the growth is inhibited, 
even in oxygen-loving bacteria. The reason is that the immune system gets activated by the pressurized oxygen, and this is the fuel uh, the white blood cells require to kill the bacteria. We call this the respiratory burst. Hmm. You can have the best car engine in the world, but if you don't fill it up with fuel, you won't get very far. So what you're saying is that medical grade chamber is necessary to kill off bacteria, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic. I remember my hyperbaric mentor who was triple board certified, including hyperbaric medicine, tell me that our bodies are amazing machines that want to heal. Given the right environment, our bodies know what to do. He often reminded me that it doesn't matter the type of bacteria. In the correct hyperbaric environment, our bodies will kill off bad bacteria and leave the good. Our bodies are truly amazingly created. But as we see, if we are not in the right hyperbaric environment, like 27% oxygen and 1.3 ATA, we can actually increase the bad bacteria. Right. So let's compare some key differences here. I see that in the hospital grade chambers, we have stem cells being released and actually the circulation going up 800% after just 20 treatments, according to the research. This has not been demonstrated to be the case in soft chambers. You can find this graph on our website when you compare what research shows about the two type of hyperbaric environments. Well, the hyperbaric societies, opinion on mild hyperbaric chambers. Let's see what they say about the mild units. The National Board of Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine, it will say these chamber types are cleared by the FDA for only treatment of mountain sickness and only when compressed with air. The UHMS does not recommend the use of mild hyperbaric therapy for any medical purpose other than acute mountain sickness. The Australian and New Zealand Hyperbaric Medicine Group, there is no known, known therapeutic benefit of mild compression. Well, just for fun, here is a picture of one of our 3,000 gallon liquid oxygen tanks being filled versus an oxygen concentrator. And this is a picture of one of our hyperbaric rooms. And I've been treating children with autism and hyperbaric since 2008. Mm -hmm. I was almost immediately blown away by the results I was seeing. I completed one IRB research study on autism and hyperbarics at 2.0 ATA in 2010. And you can read the study on the website. We have just completed a study with 64 nonverbal children who were in our ABA program. Approximately half of them did ABA alone in the study and half did ABA and hyperbarics. The ones that added the hyperbarics showed improvements in many areas. Our statistician focused on the four areas of language. We used the VB map for scoring. The results showed they acquired language two to 300 times faster wow. than those not receiving hyperbarics. In fact, our research director who is um, not part of our company. We have the statistician and both our research director are outside of ORC. Um, he's a critic, did not think it would work, and he said he was blown away. That said it all. We're currently finishing our design for our next larger study that will be similar to the next. We're hoping to put about 100 children and compare doing hyperbarics with ABA and ABA alone. And in our ABA, we're able to statistically data collect about every six seconds with our children. So we just have a plethora of data that we can compare and using the VB map with this very nice standardized tool. Well, I hope you've learned some about mm -hmm. mild and medical grade hyperbaric chambers. There's so much more we could include in this. No kidding. We only have so much time. We um, not only do offer hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, Jeff also has an approved course that we have written the curriculum for international hyperbaric certification training for our techs. It's a very intense course and a lot of physics. That's something we offer. 
That course is also offered to parents who have mild chambers. We want you to learn how to do it safely. So that is a course you can do with us remotely. You can come here and take the class in person. If you want to make sure you're using a chamber safely and correctly, we welcome you to that course. You can also visit our website at OxfordRecoveryCenter.com. Shoot us an email for any questions or concerns. And we hope to see you again for some more of our um, themed presentations. Yes. We have some fun ones coming up. What's, we do indeed. Um, uh, we have, we're doing one on autism and hyperbarics. And yes, and we're going to be doing uh, one on COVID long haulers disease. Oh, that's a very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, our Parkinson's recovery program. Right. 